in Syria. Almost 13 million people go to bed hungry after a decade of war and a horrendous earthquake. In Myanmar, conflict and political instability have thrown progress towards ending anger into reverse. In Gaza, no one has enough to eat. Climate chaos and food crises are serious and mounting threats to global peace and security, and it's only right that they are addressed by this Council. A global food crisis is creating a hellscape of anger and heartache for many of the world's poorest people. And the climate crisis is accelerating with a deadly force, and last year was the hottest ever. Both these facts undermine peace, empty bellies, fuel unrest. In Portugal, we have a saying, in a house with no bread, everyone argues and no one is right. Climate disasters and conflict both inflame inequalities, impair livelihoods and force people from their homes. That can strain relations, stoke mistrust and sow discontent. While diminished resources and mass displacement can intensify competition, conflict can easily be sparked where tensions are high, institutions are weak, and people are marginalized. And women and girls pay the highest price, just as they do when food is short and climate disasters eat. Excellencies, at the same time, climate and conflict are two leading drivers of global food crisis. Where wars rage, anger reigns. Whether due to the displacement of people, destruction of agriculture, damage to infrastructure, or deliberate policies of denial. Meanwhile, climate chaos is imperiling food production the world over. Floods and droughts destroy crops. Ocean changes disrupt fishing. Rising seas degrade land and fresh water, and shifting weather patterns ruin harvests and spawn pests. Climate and conflict were the main causes of acute food insecurity for almost 174 million people in 2022. And in many cases, they collide to its communities with a double blow. Excellencies, I am dismayed to say that our world today is teeming with examples of the devastating relationship between hunger and conflict. In Syria, almost 13 million people go to bed hungry after a decade of war and a horrendous earthquake. In Myanmar, conflict and political instability have thrown progress towards ending anger into reverse. In Gaza, no one has enough to eat. Of the 700,000 angriest people in the world, four in five inhabit that tiny strip of land. In many places, climate disasters add another dimension. Every one of the 14 countries most at risk from climate change are suffering conflict. 13 of them face humanitarian crises this year. In Haiti, Hurricanes combine with violence and lawlessness to create a humanitarian crisis for millions. In Ethiopia, drought comes hot on the hills of war. Almost 16 million people are estimated to require food assistance this year. And refugees from the conflict in neighboring Sudan are adding pressure on already scarce resources. In the Sahel, rising temperatures are rising tensions. Drying up water resources, weakening grazing land, wrecking grazing land, and ruining smallholder agriculture, the staple of local economies. Against the backdrop of long standing political instability, conflict between farmers and herders is the result. Meanwhile, globally, we risk resurgence of food inflation as drought sap the Panama Canal and violence hits the Red Sea throwing supply chains into disarray. Excellencies, 
Without action, the situation will deteriorate. Conflicts are multiplying. The climate crisis is set to spiral as emissions continue to rise, and acute food insecurity has been increasing year on year. The World Food Programme estimates that over 330 million people were affected in 2023, and it has warned of an acute deterioration in 18 anger hotspots earlier this year. To avoid mounting threats to international peace and security, we must step in and act now to break the deadly links between conflict, climate and food insecurity. First, all parties to all conflicts must abide by international humanitarian law. Far too often, this is not the case. Security Council Resolution 2417 on the protection of civilians in armed conflict is clear. Goods essential to civilians' survival must be protected. Starvation of civilians may constitute a war crime, and humanitarians must have unimpeded access to civilians in need. This Council is a, has a critical role in demanding compliance and holding those who breach the resolution to account. Second, we must fund humanitarian operations in full to prevent disaster and conflict from feeding hunger. Last year, humanitarian operations were less than 40% funded. Around a third of the money for these operations was earmarked for tackling food insecurity. Third, we must create the conditions to resolve conflict and preserve peace within countries and between countries. Exclusion, inequalities and poverty all increase the risk of conflict. Turbocharging progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals, including our goal of zero hunger, is the answer. We need massive investment in a just transformation to healthy, equitable and sustainable food systems. And we need governments, business and society working together to make such systems a reality. Today, we see a grotesque disparity between allocation and need. Globally, almost a third of food is wasted, while hundreds of millions of people go to bed hungry every night. And food consumption, production and distribution are responsible for around a third of global greenhouse gas emissions. We must create food systems that feed the planet without wrecking the planet. That means aligning climate action and food systems transformation, as I called for at the UN Food Systems Talk Take last July, to help secure sustainable development, good livelihoods and healthy people on an healthy planet. This requires working together and bringing all people, women, young people and marginalized communities into decision making. We must also build and finance social protection systems to protect livelihoods and ensure basic access to services and resources. And we must strengthen and renew global peace and security frameworks. It is vital that we make the most of the Summit of the Future later this year, where Member States will consider the proposed new agenda for peace. This presents a comprehensive vision for peace in our changing world based on prevention and international law and anchored in human rights. And it recognizes the links between sustainable development, climate action and peace. Fourth, we must get a grip on the climate crisis to limit the rise in global temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Because climate action is action for food security and action for peace. G20 nations must lead the just global phase out of fossil fuels in line with the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities in the light of different national circumstances. But all countries must create ambitious new national climate action plans or nationally determined contributions by 2025 that align with the 1.5 degree limit. We must also get serious about adaptation. Ensuring every person on Earth is protected by an early warning system by 2027 and that early warning leads to early action, and delivering adequate adaptation finance. Developed countries must clarify how they will honor the promise of 40 billion US dollars a year in adaptation finance by 2025, and they must show how the adaptation finance gap will be closed. We also need substantial contributions to the new loss and damage fund 
established in COP28. And we need to support local institutions to take the lead in reducing disaster risk in their areas. Fifth, we need to act in terms of financing. The achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals without a doubt represents the best way to prevent conflict. However, this requires investments. Today, buffeted by the cost of living crisis and unsustainable debt levels, many developing countries simply cannot afford to invest in climate action with, uh, in resilient food systems or in, into, in other sustainable development priorities. I have proposed a plan to relaunch the Sustainable Development Goals to the tune of $500 billion per year for the sustained, affordable, long-term financing of sustainable development and climate action. To achieve this, there is a need to adopt urgent measures in terms of debt by granting relief to those countries that have to face crippling reimbursements over the next three years, there is also a need to recapitalize multilateral development banks and to change their economic models in order to help them to mobilize far more private financing at a reasonable cost to developing countries. At the same time, developing countries need to prioritize expenditures to advance the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. It is distressing to observe governments' expenditures of untold sums in weaponry while continuously reducing the budgets allocated to food security, climate action, and sustainable development in general. And lastly, we need to target areas of convergence between food insecurity, the climate, and conflict. We need to forge partnerships public policies and programs that help to us to tackle challenges in a simultaneous way. For example, by taking into account the climate risks and food security in peace building or investing in climate adaptation programs to help populations to manage shared resources. The United Nations Climate Security Mechanism was devised to take into account the links between climate peace and security in our work. The Convergence Initiative was launched last year to help countries to connect climate action to the transformation of to food systems transformation. We also need to see to it that financing for climate action reaches the people and the areas that are affected by conflict. The Peace Building Fund can serve as a catalyst in order to mobilize efforts of other partners and to make this ambition a reality. And I call upon the Security Council to give thought to how best to tackle the interconnected threats on climate food security and international peace and security. It's clear. We can break the deadly nexus of anger, climate chaos and conflict and quell the threat they pose to international peace and security. Let us act to do so and build a livable, sustainable future free from hunger and free from the scourge of war. Thank you. I thank the Secretary General for his briefing.